On behalf of the Alumni Association of the University of Michigan, I'd like to welcome you to our Q&A with former Michigan men's basketball coach, John Beeline. Tonight's event is supported by the University of Michigan Credit Union, the official auto loan provider of the Alumni Association. You're invited to take advantage of their special limited time rate on auto loans. Starting at 1.75% APR, you can do more for less. Visit umcu.org and use the promo code ALUMNI when applying for an auto loan to get your low rate loan insured by NCUA. As we gear up for March Madness, the Alumni Association is excited to bring you some unique insights from longtime former Michigan basketball coach, John Beeline. Although he last coached Michigan in 2019, coach is busier than ever these days. He's in high demand as a college basketball expert and is currently working for the Big Ten Network as an analyst. Additionally, he returned to Michigan as an instructor, teaching a course on leadership in the School of Education. And asking the tough questions of Coach Beeline tonight is UM alumna Nicole Auerbach, formerly a writer for the Michigan Daily. She currently is a senior writer at The Athletic, covering college football and basketball, and was just named the 2020 National Sports Writer of the Year by the National Sports Media Association. Let's hand things over to Nicole to get things started. Thanks, Dave. Um, excited to chat with Coach Beeline. We go way back. Coach, I was actually looking this back because the first time we ever talked was for the Michigan Daily, and I found a headline from a big feature we did, and it's Knock Knock, Why the Michigan Men's Basketball Team is at the doorstep of the nation's elite and how it got there. I have to say that was in 2009. Very smart. One of the best headlines and predictions <laughs> that I have ever made in my career. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, that was, uh, that was the second year there when we end up, you know, we beat Duke and UCLA Remember, in the same week. Yep. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. And then we had the, the great, good run in February after we were, we were one in six at one time. We had that good run in, in February, and uh, we just had a we had a really good season uh, that uh, ended up getting the NCAA tournament. That, that was one of my favorite memories, actually, Nicole. When we we all stood there, we we're all in the, uh, uh, the 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 Chrysler and sitting in those big chairs, waiting for our name to be announced on the big board. And it was because it, it had been a long time since Michigan had been in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, now it's just like old hat. I mean, penciled in, just wondering what seed line where you get sent. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited we get to do this. We've got a lot of great questions from um, the alumni and also from myself. Um, and we're just going to cover, you know, a lot of memories about your time at Michigan and what you think about this year's team. But I wanted to start about being out of coaching really for the first time ever. What is that like? What is the biggest adjustment for you? I mean, coaches are a creature of habit. Yeah, it's the perfect storm, too, because you throw in COVID at the same time. It's been very, very different. I, what was really different is I spent my whole summer, you know, up, at, up uh, at our place up north, and that was very, very different for me. I really enjoyed that. I picked up golf. I actually started playing tennis again. I actually met my neighbors after being up there for eight years. I didn't know people that lived two doors away. And so that was, that was good. And then uh, I think I was rolling around, I was going along pretty well all year until the season hit that, you know, doing other things. And, that, and then now just uh, there's, there's moments in coaching, you miss it a lot. There's other moments you don't, but BTNs kept me uh, really, and teaching a course at Michigan and being an analyst with BTN has kept me really going. And, uh, but it is very, very different. Never. Uh, I think I noticed it at Thanksgiving and at Christmas that there's never been that, I've been in a Thanksgiving tournament, you know, uh, for, for 40 some years. And, uh, but we, uh, now it's March and now it's hitting me again. The March madness is really something that we, uh, we all enjoyed and, uh, uh, love to be a part of that. But it, at the same time, um, uh, you know, you can't coach forever. Does it, um, like, are you watching, obviously when you're a coach and you're kind of just preparing for your own opponents, like, are you watching teams you never would have had time to as an analyst now? You know, not, not so much outside the league because of being an analyst, I'm staying in the big 10, but I really watch the, the, the teams and know them in debt. Like if you played Rutgers once a year, you would know them really well, but not like you would if you saw them three or four times a year. And, and so I, I, 
I have a point right now with every team. I'm comfortable with every team and their style and their coaching staff and their rotations, even as they change through the year. But it's uh, it's a heck of a league, and it's really given me a really good perspective on you know how everybody coaches, how they approach the games. Uh, what's really been neat is being on the other side of the microphone of uh, doing my huddle ups, uh, doing my zooms on game day with different coaches. Uh, it's good. It, it, it's good because I, I can see in their face uh, that, 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 that look before the, of game day and you're doing a Zoom with them. That was my look for many, many years. Welcome to the dark side. <laughs> uh, what, is, what has it been like for your family? You mentioned being around for holidays. Um, yeah. how, how is Kathleen handling the increased availability of her husband? Yeah, this, this is something that's been very interesting, too. Uh, I, I think she still loves me after all this time because it's been a year now since I haven't had a game. But uh, the, it, the COVID kept us from seeing the grand. We have five grandchildren now, obviously our four children, and uh, the COVID has kept it away. But it has been nice to be able to, uh, you know, at least uh, be on FaceTime with them a lot and talk with them a lot. But Kathleen and I, we have got through this. We've done projects in the house and different things that we never – you know, I'd say just call a handyman or do something. Now I'm the handyman. Uh, we ended up getting a dog, a Vishla, a, a hunting dog that we, as a puppy, that after two months we were ready to send her back. And now she's, uh, she, she, we, we love having her around. And I walk her twice a day. I'm a dog walker now. One time I was walking, walking her, and some lady came up to me and said, "Aren't you somebody famous?" And I said. No, I'm just a dog walker. I, I'm just a dog walker. It's okay. And I just kept moving. So, but we do love Ellie is, uh, is the Vishla's name and we love her. So that's added some drama to the house. It's a, you know, it's good for the resume, the dog walking part. Yes. <laughs> current current op occupation. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of our alumni wonder, you know, if, if you ever would coach again, like do, do you, you're talking about missing those certain things, certain times yeah. of the year. Um, is there still like an itch? Yeah, I think there's still an itch at, at times. And I, I would, uh, I end, end up, you know, looking at this as sabbatical and just not trying to go too far to say, okay, I'm definitely go back in until I think I get to the end of this year. And I really know how I feel during March madness or whatever. Um, but, uh, could I do it again? Absolutely. You know, I, I, uh, at the same time, Right. It is a uh, there's there's a lot of opportunities out, out there besides coaching. I just got to sort of weigh them all and just see what what is there. And there's opportunities in coaching. Just weigh them and uh, uh, don't don't want to get a job just to get a job. We would want it to be the right thing, whether it was coaching, whether it was media, you know, teaching uh, anything, anything uh, to be involved. But I'm not ready to like, you know, go in and uh, be this retired guy that just plays golf every day. Uh, that's not going to happen. I still need to work. I'm all, I just, I, I, I still have that part in me that I got checklists that I go through every day and uh, I like being engaged. So, so let's talk about one of those jobs. You, you mentioned a couple that you're, you're juggling right now. Um, I, I would love to hear about teaching. Um, you're teaching a course on uh, leadership at Michigan. And I, I know that this is like decades ago, you, you were a teacher. Yeah. Um, so how did this come about and what is it like preparing and teaching a, a class, which I imagine is like the good parts of basketball is the teaching element. So there's some parallels there. Yeah, I, um, I love it. I, I love it. And I, I taught a class of six to 66 in the school of education and undergraduate the first semester. And now there's about 25 in a graduate school class, uh, similar classes in coaching and leadership. Uh, you know, you're going to be a you're going to be a leader whether you want to or not, as a, either as a parent, right, as a, in your in your business, uh, in, your, in somewhere in your family. And there's some certain things I've learned through trial and error along the time. So it, what happened was uh, two years ago, uh, Dean Moji from the School of Education asked me to speak at uh, the graduation as the keynote speaker for the School of Ed. And um, I spoke at it and um, I told her. After the speech, you know, I've always wanted to get back into, I love teaching. I always want to get back into teaching. Maybe someday after I uh, hang it up, uh, there'd be an opportunity. She says, oh, just call me right away. So uh, when you make that decision. So I ended up uh, calling her. I, I called her when the, the year was open. It happens, just so happened John Bacon 
was his class needed a speaker uh, or needed a teacher to replace him uh, temporarily. And so I was, uh, they were good enough. David Merritt does it with me, one of our very first yeah. you know, captains at Michigan and uh, does a great job with it. And so that's really been good. And I, I really sincerely, Nicole, I really like it. Uh, I wish it wasn't by Zoom. I really like to get to know the students better, but that will come. I plan on keep doing it depending where my career takes me now. I plan on, keep to, I would like to keep doing it. And so um, many, many years ago, when you were first starting your career, it was, it was high school history you were teaching, correct? Yes. Yeah, I was teaching seventh. Eight. I was the last one on the totem pole. So I taught seventh, eighth grade. I, I'd go and, and teach ninth grade, 11th grade. I, was, I had five different preps. I coached football, basketball, and baseball with five different preps. I played either basketball or softball like every night. I was, I was running on empty during those days, but I sincerely loved it. I think seventh grade social studies was my favorite one. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to, uh, I had great teachers at, 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 back where I grew up in uh, Newfane, New York, and at DeSales High School. And um, I just wanted to be like my teachers. And so uh, I, I wanted to make people feel really good about educating and about learning. And so uh, that's, what, that's what inspired me to do this, to be like some of the great mentors I had growing up. Um, so we have one, we solicited some questions. So um, we'll take this one from Nusha Sayadin from Instagram. Um, and the question is, what are the best traits of effective management that you've learned over the years? So I guess, what, what makes a good leader? Yeah, I thought you, you'll hear one theme with me with leadership, you know, is the, the integrity piece of it, that you can have all the answers. And if you don't have, uh, you know, in simple integrity of, you know, you don't lie, cheat or steal, but this integrity of, of doing everything you can to be at your best every day. You know, people are paying you to do your work. And uh, are you shortcutting in that in any way? I think that would be the, the one that is like up above everyone. But at the same time, I think right now there's two, two things in leadership that you, you'd like to see. And, and all, frankly, all our leaders in Washington need some of this too, is one, vulnerability. When you mess up, don't point your fingers at somebody else. Say, I goofed. You know, I made the mistake and we're going to do everything we can to get out of it. You don't know how many times that happens, you know, in basketball where you tell your team, hey, I thought that would work. It didn't work. It's on me. Let's move on. And that way you have that same attitude. And then I think empathy is a big one uh, that you, you have to you, you try to put yourself in other shoes, other, other people's shoes when you're coaching them or leading them, because that's uh, I, when I, as soon as I had, I had four children, as you know, and after when I when Andy got to the age where I could figure out his personality and I could tell Shauna, Patrick, Mark and Andy were all different personalities with different value systems, the whole thing. I realized, how could I expect my team all to be the same when my own four children are so different in many ways? It made me a better coach immediately. So understanding now they have an empathy for where other people's come from, I think is key in leadership. And I wonder too, I mean, so much has always been made of your coaching career and how you were never an assistant. And that is so unique um, in this era of, of basketball. Do you think that that contributed to, to how you lead? Because, you know, kind of you were figuring out with all that responsibilities on your own shoulders the whole way. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the, the trial and error comes in. Lots of mistakes, Nicole, going back. I, I'll go back for a reunion with some of my players, and they'll tell me some of the things that I did or said. And I said, man, that's I, I really said that, and, and, uh, or I really did that. And, and they say, yeah, but it made us better. But at the same time, it's it's stuff. I probably could have worded that differently. Uh, so it is a. Uh, it's really it's just being in that leadership position and having the experience I've had over time. I've taken a lot of the mistakes and corrected them, and now I see them and I look back at them through a different lens. I said that was really good what I used to do. I think it's really hard to understand what you're doing well. Understand prosperity and keep it going is really hard. Understand adversity is very easy. You see it right in front of you. And I, I, I say about this, and it's the truth. I used to, I used to sleep really well after a win uh, at the beginning, and I wouldn't sleep at all after a loss, and it flipped a little bit. After a loss, I would say, okay, tomorrow's film, or I'd already watched the film on the way home. We're going to be better tomorrow. I, I got some answers. After wins, 
I was all jacked up and I couldn't, I couldn't sleep because I was, well, oh, what do we got to do better? We got another game. What do we got to do better? So I think that's what it taught me along the line. But with, when you have no assistance at first, for the first maybe almost 20 years, I had no assistance. So then you have all these assistants. It's really helped me. When did that flip for you? Like the sleeping pattern? Yeah, I, I think when I probably got to West Virginia a little bit, that I realized I started embracing more of a growth mindset of losses are not necessarily the end of the world. Cause I saw it start to come around where that loss meant to win later on. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I make, I make a point of the uh, Wisconsin game that we lost in, in 13 when Tim Hardaway hit a three point shot and uh, you know, we had the game one, we, we did not have a good timeout huddle. Everybody was, was, was all excited. I, uh, I did not, uh, wasn't as clear in the message and Ben Brust ends up throwing in a half court shot. And uh, if it goes, if it doesn't go in, if it doesn't go in, we don't know we have a problem and, and it goes in, but this similar situation happened in the Kansas game in a sweet 16, the uh, Syracuse game in a final four and our huddles were on time on target prepared. We practiced those scenarios over and over again and if it doesn't go in, we might not never get to that final four that year. Maybe, maybe somebody blows a coverage, uh, including me, that uh, we blew against Wisconsin, doesn't allow us to beat Kansas. So, so let's go back to, to the very beginning and, and taking the Michigan job. Um, I can see Michigan game balls behind you. I know you're still in Ann Arbor. You're teaching at the school. Yep. Clearly, this is a place that is very important to you. But when you first take that job, what are your expectations of – what it would be like, what the build would yeah. need, um, Ann Arbor itself, any any of those. Yeah, I think leaving, being in West Virginia, we really had a good team uh, at West Virginia, and 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 the program was at a point where um, we really had the culture set. We had the recruits coming in that we wanted, that were unique to how you build a program, and it came here, and uh, we had just upgraded our facilities at West Virginia. And uh, so it was good. We loved Ann Arbor. We loved this idea that we had this incredible academic institution that was so good. But Frank, things were broken in a lot of ways. Uh, we we had we did not have good practice facilities. I, I, I we, we did not have just, just just that type of investment in the future of the program. I make the analogy that one time we're getting ready to play Michigan State and we had to practice. I'm, and I'm not saying it's, we had to practice at Pioneer to get ready for the game because I think there was either wrestling or gymnastics match in our arena and we couldn't have it during that time. Once we got the building built, just do some math on that one. Once we got the practice facility uh, built, I think Michigan's only missed the NCAA tournament one time. Yeah, if you, They would have made it last year in the COVID, only one time. And they hadn't made it for, but we, you know, one time they made it in the f- prior 12 years. So uh, that it really helped that we were able to change the mindset that this is important. And, um, you know, Bill Martin started it. Uh, Mary Sue Coleman put her stamp on it. Dave Brannon put his foot on the accelerator with it. And uh, it all worked out really well. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like uh, the renovations to Chrysler and the building of the facility, which you know, I, I, every time I go somewhere, they always want to give me the tour of the practice facility yeah. and it's as nice as you're going to see anywhere. And, um, obviously for the women's too. And now you see the women's yeah. program off to, you know, their best startup yeah. program history. It, it rises. It just caught the programs rise when you have no, it. without question, both programs that you watch them right now, Kim Barnes, Rick has done a great job. And as, as I said, we were, we were starved everywhere. I mean, wrestling had no place to go. I think gymnastics might have just, but they didn't have an arena to go. And it was just, if we were going to compete in the Big Ten, if you went to the other places in the Big Ten, they had resources. And Michigan did not have resources. And with, with They were just starting to build a few places. But since then, look at the South Campus. Look at all these things. It's just, you know, you, you're going to go through a lot of coaches if you don't have the resources not to pay them. I'm not talking about paying them. I mean, they can teach and coach. And Michigan, the administration is Michigan – has gone 100 percent behind athletics, and it's been a great change. And you look at all our teams, not just some of our teams; all our teams are really strong. And it's a lot because of the commitment from and support of the alums and the commitment from the administration. 
So we've got a question from Robert Brown from Facebook. Um, he wants to know what coaching accomplishment are you most proud of of your time at Michigan? You know, that's, that's always a tough one because you, it's really hard to compare so many moments that we've had at Michigan and everywhere in our life. I'll tell you one that one that stands out though is Watson Austin Hatch go to the foul line and make a foul shot. I'm really proud of that. That to watch a young man go through what he went through and live his dream of being on the Michigan fan. Nicole, he was going to be so good. I mean, he was going to be a three year starter. He was he, he's really a good player. And to have him go through what to, what he went through and then be a part of this team, graduate from Michigan, uh, all those things. You know, the trophies and the, the, all those other things are good, but it's the value you put in moments like that that really is why many of us coach, many coaches coach. Yeah, and I feel like just even his role in the program, like still coming to Michigan, still being around, like it, it was just one of the more remarkable things and inspiring things if you ever got a chance to talk to him, which I don't know if anyone who's listening has, but just really, really an incredible incredible guy have you do you keep up with him how is he doing oh yeah we stay in contact because he's I do I do a fair amount of speaking now and so does he so we we talk he spoke at my class uh yeah we, we I love us we've stayed in, in touch with uh, he and Abby and they uh you know we're a bit of a neighbors up up north at our places so uh I you know I love the young man and uh no that's a lifetime relationship we're gonna have do you uh, keep like when with, with former players? I mean, obviously, some, some of them, you know, maybe are like that. There's a bond that's just very different than just a normal coach player. Yeah. But um, like, how often do coaches talk to their former former players, especially like ones in the NBA? I'm sure busy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that means that you you want to hit them up more. Like, what what is that balance like? Well, I, I put I put every one of my 42 years going way back to my high school days, players in the same place because they all are special to me and no one has more importance than the other one. And so I really try to, and that's a lot of players, Nicole, that's, that's a couple hundred of them and staying in touch is really hard. But I, uh, I look, for example, one of my last games in Michigan, I had 13 players, 13 to the 14 players on my JV basketball team at Newfane come to Ann Arbor and spend, and, and we had dinner together. And so those guys are special as well. Uh, but everybody, you know, I pretty much stay in touch with everybody from time to time. Um, we, uh, uh, the guys in the NBA have been very good. Uh, and, uh, Duncan's funny where I'll, I'll say that I'll, I'll, I don't text them very much because they get tons of texts. I'll tell Duncan, Duncan, don't text me back. And he'll text me back. <laughs> I'm always going to text you back. But those guys, you know, Karis is going through something right now. We've reached up. I got to see a lot. A lot of them last year, I got to see Glenn Robinson and, and many of Mo and Mo does talk. I find out that Mo does talk trash uh, when he's to the other team. I never knew that I was naive because he was talking trash to me during our game with Washington. So, but he, uh, I, I'd say I, I, I try to do my best, but what's really hard is uh, they have one coach. I have 250 former players. So it's hard to just do it the way you'd like to do it. Uh, Cause you still have a family and you still have, uh, a lot of friends and uh, other people you want to stay in contact with too. Is there, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting about college coaching is you end up recruiting guys that don't play for you. Do you stay in touch with them? Like, is there a favorite recruit that you didn't get at Michigan? Like what happens at that point? Yeah. You know, I, I saw that question ahead of time. I don't think so. I move on very quickly. Cause yeah, Nicole, we had, we had the, uh, the message that we had the philosophy we do not care who we don't get. We care who we get. And I, I it, but I'm always, uh, you know, when you shake hands with guys afterwards, or I see them later on in the pros or I do things like that. It, it's a very, very uh, a good relationship of respect. But if they didn't choose Michigan, I, I, I respected every bit of it. Uh, but uh, there's uh, we did not, you know, we moved on. We care more about the guys that we had on our bus. You know, who, who was with us uh, because we more times than not, I would really feel good about the people that we recruited, whether it was Michigan, West Virginia, Richmond, Canisius, Lemoyne, Nazareth, Erie Community College or Newfane High School. Those those young men that we had play for us are all special to me. 
So, so you were talking about this earlier about like, you know, how you sleep after a bad loss or, mm-hmm. or a big win. Um, I, I know that, you know, some of the, there's always certain losses and certain wins that are always going to kind of really be, you know, you could relive it in your mind at any real point. Like, it, so I'm curious, like the most painful loss at Michigan and then also the best win, like when you think back over your time, cause there's a lot of options, what you would characterize for each. Yeah, that, that's a, in the same category. Uh, every loss uh, it, it hit me so hard. They all have the same degree of pain. And as I got better, I, I realized uh, there's a temporary just, uh, you know, uh, pain that, that is intense right afterwards. And then you grow, you just go over it in the next 24 hours. You just got to fight through the next 24 hours and learn as much as you can about why. So that they're all the same. And the wins, I said, there are some great ones. Uh, but I, I don't like to differentiate one from another because I te- truthfully can't tell the difference. You know, you'll have the ones where, you know, they're the buzzer beaters, the Burke, the Burke shot, the Jordan Poole shot uh, that are, you know, really special to our fans and, and uh, they're special to players and whatever, you know, but I think it's some, you know, I think also of times like that, that in 2010, we had to go to Minnesota and win. We were, I, I heard we were, I remember going to the game or something and it was like uh, Michigan's on the bubble. And I was like, we're on the bubble. how do we get on the bubble? And then Manny Harris hit a little shot and, and, and we won the game and we're in the locker room at Minnesota, but we're not in the tournament, but all of a sudden we had a really good road win. And, uh, and it was like, you know, that was really special because I knew we were closer to getting to that point where there was credibility to the, to the program as far as getting the NCAA tournament, but not more special than, than any other thing. I mean, they're all really, they're all part of this, this uh, journey that we were fortunate enough to have at Michigan. So although, like you said, I mean, certain wins are equal in your eyes. I'm sure it's like saying who your favorite child is and things like that, like all of these very special wins to you. Um, but celebrations tend to be a little bit better when they're more dramatic at the end of the game. Like, do you have a favorite post-game celebration, favorite super soaker moment? <laughs> I, I tell you, what. here's what I do love to do. This does separate things. When people send me videos of their reactions after they we won a big game. Like, I would have loved, when Jordan Poole hit that shot, I would have loved to have been at one of the local establishments in Ann Arbor with all the fans watching that. I could watch that forever to see how people reacted. Uh, and so uh, that's what I missed. I, I, I miss I miss seeing, you, you almost don't even see your own family celebrate after wins. And that's a, that's a part in coaching you don't get to do. But in the locker room, I think any time that we, we moved on, we're really big. I think both times that we moved on to the final four, we're big. Uh, Matt Bogrich hit me with some Gatorade in Dallas, Texas. That was uh, that I did, was not expecting. And then when we in LA, when we got that win in LA in front of a, a Michigan crowd in California, I mean, I mean, tens of thousands of Michigan fans. Uh, that was really that was really special too. So, uh, but the uh, it, it, you just it's hard to say. And then there's, obviously the Super Soaker one. I mean when you go through what led up to it, you know, we're on the bubble, our, our plane crashes, <laughs> yeah. we go into Washington, right. And, and win. And then we end up beating Oklahoma state in a, like a high scoring game and beat Louisville. Uh, that was pretty special too. Uh, my aim with the super soaker wasn't very good, but it got the job done. We really celebrated. Did you like, is the super soaker like next to those, like, Special yeah, we, you know what? The the company <laughs> sent me a box of them. I got I got so many super soakers. I still have them. Where I think at some point when the grandkids are over, we're going to have a huge super so- soaker party. But I got I got a lot of them. They were good enough to send me a whole bunch of them because I think I might have helped their that weekend. We might have helped their sales that weekend. I, lo- I love that you've become a so- super soaker influencer. That's what I'm going to now now refer to you as. <laughs> Um, I definitely was. I, they must have. They wouldn't have sent them to me. But you know, it was really neat that, that I went to the NCA. We went to the NCA, uh, to, what, to the Final Four that year. That Mark Emmer, the president of the NCA, 
we were talking about, they were in a big discussion and they were talking about the NBA versus the NCAA. And they're talking about, uh, you know, the differences that, that what was our brand and all these things. And Mark Emmert says, I guarantee you, there's no NBA coach that walks in to a locker room with a super soaker. And I was out in the crowd. I didn't even know what he was going to say. It was funny. That's great. Um, so we have a couple of questions, um, a little bit about the game of basketball over the course of yeah. your career. Um, I guess just, oh, you know, again, from start to finish, you, you've mentioned New Fane, all, all the very beginning of Lemoyne. How has the game changed and how is it evolving now? Well, I just gave this speak. I was speaking with a company the other day and we were talking about that, that they needed to embrace change because the, the, their industry was changing. And I just said that basketball has changed so much. No shot clock, 45 second shot clock, 35 second shot clock, 30 second shot clock, no line. Here's the line. Let's move the line back further. Uh, but I think with, with everything, I think the big thing is it's predominantly man to man everywhere. There's very few people playing zone at all because of the three point line. The ball screen has taken over the game. I can tell you, Nicole, that at, uh, at West Virginia, I started using the ball screen a little bit. Um, very little at Richmond more of a passing type of offense. Um, and that's what the biggest change is. And then defenses, everybody is, is, is man to man, man to man. And you, you uh, some people are switching a lot of screens. That's what's good about Michigan's team right now. They can switch a lot of screens. They have, they have a versatile, the dream team of having guys that can switch at four positions sometimes. And uh, the, the computer has changed that how people play because you know, if you used to have their your stat sheet, if you got the team stats back in the 80s, you felt like you had the best scouting report in the world. Now you go on Synergy and you can see, you know, how many times, you know, somebody got two feet in the paint. Did they pass to the right? Did they pass to the left? Did they, did they throw it to the big man? And you can guard. The technology is amazing what you can do. And you can – analytics is really important. You can overdo it too and screw yourself up. There's still some important things – that people have to do that has nothing to do with analytics. It has to do with just playing winning basketball. So we've got a question um, from Lee Ledet from Facebook. Um, in your opinion, what is the most important aspect of any offensive half court set? I've always leaned towards spacing. Yeah, I think spacing is really important, uh, but all those sets don't mean anything. If you, you have the great spacing, what's important thing is people are, are fundamental they can make that they can make plays under pressure, uh, and and you know be able to pivot, pass on time, on target, you know, and understand their offense. But yeah, you can't have everybody together. And it was, uh, I think Bobby Knight's teams were great at having everybody fifteen feet apart. Then now in today's game, sometimes that's not so good. You want every you want you know guys sitting in the corners, uh, at, as far away from each other as possible. And, you, you know, uh, two guys, a ball screen in the middle. Now is it really a four on four game as far as your spacing goes? So uh, but I would agree with that. And have, but having people sets don't make any difference. You don't have the people that can can, you know, it's not just people that can play. It's people that can pivot, can pass, can share the ball because uh, that's important. Spacing isn't any good if they can't pass the ball. So bigger picture. Um... There's, a, there's just been a lot of changes in college sports, I mean, outside of the game itself. And, and now we're heading into name, image, and likeness reform, the transfers. Yeah. That's been happening for a number of years, but it's going to happen, you know, with the new rule, too. What has that piece of the evolution been? It's yeah. almost, it, from, from my perspective as someone who covers it, it's, it's more shifting the power balance a little bit more towards the players. Yeah, I think this is this is going to be interesting to see how it all plays out, Nicole. I don't know enough about it. I do know that recruiting is really difficult, and you're you're trying to. I still want to be keep the main thing the main thing. That we have a institution in Michigan that if you look around, you're you're going to be in a classroom with champions of all kinds uh, that are going to be champions in the business world. They're going to be champions in the medical world. They're going to be NHL champions. They're going to be Olymp Olympians. Uh, they're going to be incredible engineers. And we got to keep that the main thing. Not, don't, don't necessarily go to a place because of what type of shoe they wear or what type of gear they have or that they have a better deal for you in, in, in something like that in imaging. 
I, I, and I know that's very naive and a bit Pollyanna by me, but it is also, that's how I would continue to recruit. Uh, I really, seriously, and, and I love the Jordan brand. I just never wanted anybody to come because it was Jordan brand. I wanted them to come because it was Michigan and they knew that we were a team first program that was going to do things the right way. Now it helped. That was, that was an influencer. You know, Jordan brand was, was an influencer. Uh, at the same time, uh, I just never felt we never sold that uh, the way I wanted as much as I wanted to sell. This is Michigan and it's OK. Remember, Nicole, we don't care who we don't get. We want to get we, we care who we get. And it's one of the biggest advice I give to businessmen, too, when they're putting their team together. When in, in another adjustment, and, and I remember because this was when I was at Michigan was when this first started happened was not having guys until they graduate, right? Like Michigan, your teams and the talent, they got so good that they had to leave and go yeah. to the NBA early. And I remember that that was, that's an adjustment, I'm sure, for any coach yeah. to go through. Um, how did you approach those? Because ultimately, like, obviously you want, you wanted these guys to, you know, have yeah. their entire careers, yeah. but you're also thrilled for them that they have this opportunity in the NBA. Yeah, I think hockey and ourselves have the, have the biggest problem. Uh, baseball has a great you know, they, they're going to lose a guy because they signed him. And then he not too many kids are going to they're going to go to the pros unless they're really getting big money in the first or second round. And then football has it built in the three year rule, which is terrific. Uh, baseball, you got to wait three years if you don't go. But hockey and, and uh, basketball really have a dilemma there. And I, I think what as long as you can keep it this way, uh, we were able to adjust. That we, we would traditionally tell people, listen, unpack your bags like you're here four years. I, every, that, we never had a player come in that we recruited didn't want to be a pro. We understand that. But if all you think about is being a pro, your chance of getting there are not going as not as good as you just think about your team, the team, the team, and getting better. And, and don't, don't, be, don't be thinking about that. And perfect example is like, like Tim Hardaway. You know, when Tim Hardaway was a junior, it was like his daddy, and his sophomore, he didn't even, he didn't even, he was a really good sophomore now and, and, and a great freshman. He didn't even think about it. He just, I'm not ready. I, I, I'm like in Michigan so much. And now where he is, where is he now? Like his eighth year in the NBA as a starter for Dallas. And so Nick Stauskas, like the second year, he, he was slighted a little bit. Uh, because none of the pro camps they have, Nike even in, in, in invited them. So he just focused on getting better and not worrying about that. And all of a sudden, he's a, he's a lottery pick. Uh, Mo Wagner was great at that. They all were. So that's that was, but it is hard because you're when you're you're seeing a freshman and you're you you, uh, you have a freshman and you're been and you know that there might be outside pressures too. And I don't mean bad pressures. It could be a family that is, that is really destitute right now. And the obviously making a, a second, being a second rounder is better than their situation right now. So it is hard to navigate. There's no question about it. And the, if you watch Wisconsin, they're, they're consistently at the top and they have had one guy pro go pro early during their time one, and they're consistently at the top. So that, the, 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 the lack of attrition has really been huge. No one has had more first round draft choices in the league than Michigan. And we've been able to adjust. We've been able to adjust. Now the transfer rules worry me and the graduate transfer things worry me a little bit too, that people are not unpacking their bags that when they get adversity, I want to transfer somewhere else or go to the NBA. And now it, that's really hard to coach in those situations. So, so let's talk about this year's team because all of these pieces are actually very relevant. Um, you know, kind of it's the transfer market working yep. really well and, yep. and really committing to, to where, they, where the players have gone. Um, so, you know, we're, we're lucky we're doing this right coming off of the big win over Ohio State. Yep. Probably the best yep. game of the con of the, in the country this year. Um, we're talking about two teams that were both number one seeds in the first, like, look in at the bracket. Could possibly end up there as well. Um, what jumps out at you when you first, you know, someone first, first thing that people want to know about this year's Michigan team from your eyes, like what, what impresses you? What, what are the things that, that you like the most? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to say this because back when I saw them earlier, I think I saw the central Florida game 
And I said, my goodness, this team is really good. And the one big thing that I saw that defensively, everybody was buying into defense and playing it, and they all could do that. And second of all, the ball did not stick. Nicole, what that means is that people don't get thirsty and the ball comes to them and their teammate has a better shot, but they haven't shot in a while. So I'm going to let this one ride because I'm not getting the ball enough. That is not happening on this team. You, you take, you know, the guys that, that the two transfers that are there, they have never won. They just want to win. You know, there's, there's that th this team, and I've never seen a team with nine seniors, the scout team, all these, they just want to win. There's no agenda out there of people. They've all unpacked their bags for the season and said, we just want to win. And that's, that's where our best teams as well. And so it's, uh, it's fun to watch because they guard people. They share the ball. Uh, they look like they're really having fun out there. And they're, they're, you know, I know a lot of them obviously, and they're terrific kids. And they, that's all we were trying to do is find, find the right roster uh, to uh, that represents this great university. And uh, we, with any, any of the new guys that they have, Juwan's done a great job of finding the same type of people that we did. And, and Hunter Dickinson is just a monster. Yeah. Like, I don't know how anyone, I mean, clearly other teams have struggled trying to defend him. That's, that's going to be a huge matchup problem, whoever they play the next month. Yeah. He's, he's a, He's a once in a decade, maybe once in every two decade, big man that you get at a university. Uh, and he's because he, you know, and he can shoot it a little bit uh, because uh, our guy, we were recruiting him for a couple of years uh, and Juwan came and did a great job of finishing that one up. And, he, but he can shoot, he can shoot it eventually, but there's no drama when Hunter gets the ball. There's no drama. He just puts it in. A lot of big men, there's a lot of drama when they get in there. They'll get themselves the, – the game is hard for them when they get in the crowd. Because of his size and his feel and maybe being left-handed, uh, there's no drama. The ball's in the basket. So um, he's a special young man that uh, has really been a, a big difference maker. When you can throw it inside and they have to double and then he's a good passer. A lot, of, a lot of big guys, you can double and takes their game away. You double him, he sees over the top, and he's really a skilled passer. And as a result, it's uh, uh, they are, they're really effective. That really adds a lot to it with all those veterans around him. Yeah, it feels like he, you know he has a mature game, and then like you said, the veterans. That was something that you know whenever you watch Michigan, especially against Wisconsin, you know the second time, and then the Ohio State game, there was just no nobody freaked out, nobody got nervous. The poise late in games is something that you don't always see in college basketball teams, which do have, you know, a variety of ages and maturity yep. levels. But that seems to be one of the strengths of this team, too. Well, Hunter Dickinson, and obviously Hunter playing at the math high school, played in some packed, packed crowds. You know, you're, you're a national, you yep. play a national schedule. But look at Franz Wagner. He's played all over the world in many, many games. Uh, the Brown and Smith have been starters at Wake Forest and Columbia their whole lives just yep. trying to win. And then Eli Brooks and Isaiah Livers and Austin Davis run final four teams. They don't know what it's like not to go to the sweet 16 at least. And so these guys have been there before. And, and then, uh, and then Jawan's been there before and the coaching staff has been there before. So it's a perfect mix right now. It's really a perfect mix. Now to go, to move on, uh, you could, you could do everything you want. You got to get lucky. You got to, we were always lucky. And sometimes we were very unlucky. And so that, that's big point right now. You got to make some shots. You got to stay injury free. You know, you have to, you have to find some, maybe the team you're playing gets that you're a bad matchup gets knocked off in the game before you play them. I know that's happened a couple of times to, for us. So it is, uh, they can advance right now and they got the, they have that, but it's not just all about talent and coaching right now. There's a lot of luck involved. We were better. We, were, we 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 benefited from several times, and as I said, other times, look at look at uh, Elite Eight and Kentucky hits it from half court. Well, when Jordan Poole made that shot, I I did not feel far, sorry for Houston because I know Kentucky didn't, didn't feel sorry for us in that Elite Eight game. So it's those things are going to happen, and uh, they'll be ready for it. So. Coach Howard hasn't coached in the NCAA tournament yet because of last year. They didn't have it. Um, what advice would you give him or, or really anyone kind of walking into that environment for the first time? 
Well, you got to just treat it the same. I mean, you, you really have to go into this thing with this idea. You have, you're usually going to find out, you know, hopefully they're playing Sunday in the Big Ten Championship, and you're going to be playing somebody Thursday or Friday. And uh, the, uh, you got to go into this thing like you normally, oh, I got, we got a game Friday. And even though you got a game Sunday, I mean, we never paid much attention to who you're playing Sunday. I, I would have if, let's say, Syracuse was in that bracket the next day or a Princeton-type team was in that bracket. We might have done something that you can't prepare for in one day. But basically, take care of that one game at a time. Focus on that because they got to focus on you too. And just, but if you're not good at what you do, right, then they don't have to focus as much. Get get your guys some rest, but you got to keep them going. And uh, he's been in a lot of playoff situations, Nicole. Don't worry about him. Did um did you guys have like a strategy? I mean, obviously you've had different assistants over the years, but like for that two day turnaround. I think people are always so curious how that works because certain teams are better at that and then others. Like, is, is there a different prep strategy for that or no? Well, well we, we would, like I said, I don't think one time we worried that what, as soon as you get the, as soon as you get your bracket, you get the, you get the, the downloads of all the teams you're playing of, of those three other teams, the one you're playing, you, I would pour into that. We'd assign, we'd assign somebody that one with me. And then the two other assistants would take the two other teams in the other bracket. And then within one day, I would say anything unusual in that other bracket. And if there was nothing unusual, we didn't pay any attention to them. And those two coaches just stayed on the, those two teams. And then we get to the game, you know, whether you play them after those two coaches are then watching the game the next when they play live, but they've also got a lot of video on them. And then, you know, you hope we always were trying to have a team that was hard to scout. Hmm. And uh, so that when we, we, we play somebody, yeah, even if they were hard to scout, at least we were hard to scout too. We weren't too much. This is what we do. We're going to jam it down your throat and play. Uh, that's really, really hard because people can really sit on those things now that there's so much technology. So we practice be, being that way and being very flexible in how we could play. But uh, when you, if we win that first game, that first game, then we were ready. And you should see the, the two coaches that are doing the other game. One is in for like no sleep, right, for a day. And the other one, you know, he, he goes back to us, which is much different. And uh, it's really funny how the game before you'll be in overtime. And they're going back and forth. And I know one is one is really, oh, man, I'm in it. I, I'm into it now. And the other one, oh, thank God. I yeah. don't have to go through that. But uh, we, we, we were very fortunate to have some success there. Yeah. And those those assistants, they usually would put them like right behind press row. So you could see them as they're like, you know, kind of analyzing those teams. which was always interesting. The, the Big Ten tournament, Nicole, is even, you know, that's the next day or it could be the next yeah. afternoon. 20, yeah. Yep, yeah, You play at night and then you play the afternoon. So same thing. They're out there watching. But it's good practice because if you're in the Big Ten tournament and you're in the NCAA tournament you're just ready to roll and the team's ready to roll too but you don't even go to the gym in the big 10 tournament after you start you're all just walking through a ball ballroom yeah. uh, and uh same thing in the ncaa tournament very rarely unless we had a really late game would we do anything on game day so when you think about obviously you, you've taken teams to the final four you've taken teams to the national championship game what are the characteristics of teams that can make those kinds of runs um, they, they really are connected as a team. They're, they're, they're really um, unselfish and team first guys that they're really, uh, they don't have agendas. And there's too, too many times there's, there's, and it's not the young men's fault that they have all kinds of media attention, Twitter accounts. Now agents can be in contact with them and people can get, can get distracted. And the ones that aren't distracted are the ones that really believe in the team. And that's their main goal. And uh, that's, that's why we were able to do it, you know, on the occasions that we did, or even getting through that first round is hard too. And so um, we were able to, to get that, get that done because of, once again, we had pretty good people on the bus that sort of got it or, or they watched others. You look at the, you know, guys uh, like Muhammad Ali, you know, he watched Derek Walton and, and Zach Irvin grow over time. Uh, he watched us on TV when we went to the championships. And uh, all of a sudden, there he is. Mo Wagner, the same thing. Couldn't, couldn't stay on the court as a freshman. But as he watched us get better, he was ready to step up. 
So uh, it's really uh, the, uh, the those guys. Though, you do look at Duncan Robinson, who was tremendous, tremendous player. You know, willing to to come off the bench what, for so that our rotation would be different, and that he actually got great uh, starter minutes because of it. But he was the one guy we could count on come off the bench and nail a shot right away. So there was really uh, selfless teams. So so in this year's conversations like throughout the whole season the way that everything's been framed is Gonzaga and Baylor and everybody else um I, I feel like you know again when you watch Michigan Ohio State you're looking at this game you're like this is a final four caliber game these teams are really really good Michigan obviously this is a great team I mean it, it the Big Ten from top to bottom has just been brutal it is it is such a fight night in and yeah. night out I, I sort of wonder if like the Big Ten best teams are being undervalued in like that national championship conversation. Am I wrong or do we feel like we're starting to get there and talk about Michigan as a potential national championship contender? Well, I mean, that's your line of work to, to be able to do. I don't You're think on our the, side the, now. You're allowed to say these things. Uh, yeah, the, 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 you know, I don't, there's so much, there's so much speculation on it. And that's why we have a tournament. It's different than football where every, oh, who's going to be in the final the final four, I mean, people judge it. They judge who should be in the, the final four in football, right? And that's your thing, you know? In, in college basketball, you get to play for it. And so who, who really cares? I mean, sometimes you could be a one seed and that's you get the wrong – let's say you beat the 16 team or you, you think Tony Bennett was glad he was a one seed against UMBC, you know? The, the, uh, the, the, you can determine what you're going to do. And I don't think there's a coach out there that matters whether they're getting enough hype going into this thing. I guess and it's not I, hype, I but don't, like, I, do, just do you think those teams best. are – it's not necessarily hype. Like, do you believe in those teams enough? Like, do we think that those – Oh, they the Big Ten, yeah. Oh, the Big yeah. Ten, the seven of the last ten years we've been in the Final Four. Right. And, and I think five of those seven were from the state, great state of Michigan, right? And, and that's why I talk about – that rivalry, how, how incredible it is because of the success both teams have in both season. And uh, so you can win the Big Ten, you can win the national championship, but it might come down to matchups and things like that. I think this year, and obviously if you have four teams in, your chance of winning the national championship are lower. You have eight teams in or nine teams in, your t- chance of winning the national championship are higher because there's a lot of things that are going on. But the league – the league, because of the Big Ten Network, because of the great leadership in the league, the presidents, the alumni base, the league is stronger than ever right now. And it's just a matter of time before we get another national championship. But the button, nobody wants to win the national championship in February, Nicole. We want, they want to win it in April. They want to win it in the first week in April. So that's what they would care about right now. Welcome to you know, creating content and you know creating news cycles. Like, it's, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Um, so I, I did want to ask you, you brought up the rivalry of Michigan state. One thing that I always think is interesting is what we, as you know, the public and fans, um, maybe don't see about your, you know, types of jobs. Like when you're the Michigan head coach, like your relationship with Tom is it like your relationship with rivals or other coaches in the yeah. league. What are, what are some of those things? If you peel back the curtain, um, that people might be surprised to learn about like those types of relationships. I don't think that there's there's any hate in any of those. I, I, I sincerely think I, I know that there's not a, at least from, from our part. I just respect everybody so much, and I look looked at that. You know, give them a lot of respect because we all go through a lot of things. Um, is there love? Uh, probably not that either. But I would say that of the of the coach, now there's been a big turnover of coaches in my 12 years. I think there's only only Matt Painter and Tom Izzo are still there. So, but many of them, be, just because, I don't know, maybe it's who we recruit or how we recruit. We tend up to be in the same circles or it could be geographic. But I think that, that I, I pride myself in, you know, I do the huddle ups on Big Ten Network right now that I can laugh with any coach out there. And I don't think anybody, again, has an agenda or is upset I hope they're not upset with me. And I'm not, a, there's, there's just not that type of thing over that maybe you find in some other sports. I'm not saying it's wrong or right. Basketball is different. You know, like you take, for example, like a guy makes a commitment in basketball to go to a school. Very rarely will a coach ever, you know, try to steal that commitment or what do they call it? Uh, what do they call it in, in your world? They call it uh, 
flop, flip, flop, flip. flip. Yeah, okay. flip. Yeah. It never happens in college. That very rarely, because nobody everybody's hands off. We're all gentlemen about it a little bit. In football, they're trying to flip people like crazy. So that can get to be a little bit more like this. And you yeah. play them one time a year. That can get to be like this. Where oh, okay, we lost them, but we're gonna play them later on. Or we might we can get them in the tournament. I mean, you just think about that. You could lose to a you could lose to a team to, uh, two or three times and go to the na- and and go to the national cha- and win the national championship. So this it's different and I pride myself in being sort of being that guy that's Switzerland there that is just like neutral and just tries to, to really respect everybody. So let's do, let's wrap this up with a couple of rapid fire questions and then we'll get to our video questions because a couple of people submitted that way. Um, so rapid fire favorite non basketball Michigan sporting event to go to. Non basketball. I, I I think that the the two of them that I that I really liked. I'll give you two of them. Was the Notre Dame night football game. I think was was in, incredible uh, experience for us to 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 win that one. Come back the way we did. And I, I really liked the outdoor hockey game that we had when there was you know I don't know how many people, but there was a lot of people at the game watching that outdoor hockey. I, re- I really like that. But you know what, what's sad about being a, the coach at Michigan is you do not get the free time to go to all the events. I probably saw almost every team play and that's sad. I wish I saw every team play every season several times, but you just don't have time to do that. But I did make most of the football games, go to a hockey game, you know, once or twice a year, cause they play Fridays and Saturdays and we were either tra- traveling or preparing. Yeah. So, uh, but those were, those are my favorite. What's your favorite time of year in Ann Arbor? Oh, I, I think the fall is. I think when uh, the leaves are changing, the weather's still good. You know, the band, you can hear the band playing in the background when you're, you know, around campus. They're, they're practicing. Uh, that is a, uh, that, that's my, really my favorite time. What is your go-to sandwich order at Zingerman's? Oh, the Reuben, without question. It would, I just, I had it last, I had it yesterday. What I do is I order it. I don't eat that much. So I order the big one. And then I end up at half next day. I get all this hot mustard. I, I put it on there, man. It, it's, it's the, it's the best. It's the best. I go to, I supposed to have the Turkey Reuben more than the regular Reuben, but I'm cheating every now and then. Don't tell my doctor. Did you, is that somewhere where you would take recruits? Like, did you get to eat a lot of Zinger? Uh, no, we didn't go there much because it, it was, you know, you usually have to stand in line and we're usually, th- but we would, we would get the sandwiches sometimes for recruits, you know, when they were here, when, if they're on an official visit. Uh, but, but we, there was a lot of great restaurants we could take recruits to. What's the favorite venue that you've coached in that's not Chrysler? Man, I, th- I, I got to say that, the two, I mean, the, the two final fours, I mean, 70,000. Now, in Atlanta, I would not look up at the crowd. I just would not do it. I just stayed, my eyes stayed here the whole time. I didn't want to see how big it was because I just felt it might affect me or something. I don't know why. And then that when we got to San Antonio, I said, I'm looking up this time. I'm going to embrace this. I don't know if I'm going to get another one of these. I, I wanted to embrace those, but those are special. I think San Antonio, even though... We didn't, we, we didn't, Villanova was probably the best team to play in the, in the last decade in the final four, I felt. Uh, that was such a great venue to have a final four. The weather was good for all us Michiganers and uh, that was really special. But uh, th- those two final fours, I, 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 uh, those were really special because you, you get to the championship game and it's 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 uh, Monday night because we talked about that. We we did, we referred to it not winning the national championship. We want to get to Monday night. You know, we talked about that all the time. If you want to get to Monday night, and we talked about that overnight, and there we are on Monday night twice. Pretty good. Pretty good. What did it feel like to look up when you looked up in San Antonio? Yeah, just oh, yeah, I, I probably uh, had a a. a, a a moment where I might have even cursed something, but in a good way <laughs> to say, you know, oh my God, holy, this is like it long, long way for, from a guy from Burt, New York to be, to be doing that, that, you know, grew up playing on a basket, uh, beating up old basket in his backyard. All right, let's see some video questions. So I'm going to toss it to Anna in Ann Arbor. 
I have a foodie question for you. If you could eat one more meal at any restaurant in Ann Arbor, what restaurant would that be? Yeah, the, uh, that, I'm not much of a foodie. I'm not. We're, we're, my wife, I'm fortunate, Kathleen is an incredible cook. But we've really uh, come to like, uh, but between Paisano's and the Earl, I think have become our favorite restaurants right now. But, but we like a lot of them, a lot of them. All those Main Street venues are great too. Okay, our next question is from Mark in Louisville. How do you view the renewed efforts to recruit big centers and must they be excellent three-point shooters? I don't know if that's a renewed a effort as much as people want, uh, everybody wanted to have a, uh, you know, a, a good big man, you know, and we were fortunate, you know, when, when you go all the way back to when Deshaun Sims played over there, but he was only 6'8". But uh, our first recruit, Ben Cronin, would have been a great one, just never got to play at seven feet one. But, you know, Mo Wagner and John Teske, uh, Jordan Morgan, you know, Mitch McGarry, uh, these guys were, they, uh, John Horford, they were all good, 6'9", six, 6'10", six, and uh, not too many. Mo was the only one that was a really dynamite shooter. But you, you like to have it all. And uh, I, I believe Hunter Dickinson might have it all one day. Uh, because he certainly is the best, uh, best freshman big man, but most prepared big man to come to Michigan in a long, long, long time. Uh, let's throw this one over to Scott in Northville. I was curious to hear about how preparation for NCAA tournament games might vary from regular season, especially the second game of the weekend and the shorter prep time that you have there. Thank you. Yeah, it was um, because we were in the Big Ten tournament, you know, they're, they're, you're pretty much um, – you're going to do very little on the court. You are going to go to the arena and shoot the day in between in the NCAA tournament. You will get on that court again. The first time you're on the court, you always have a crowd there. So you can't, like, run your plays because the opponent you're about to play is watching, and you don't want to give them any, anything special on it. The second time you're you're only in there with one NCA administrator, and you can have a pretty. They give you about an hour and a half, so you can have a pretty good workout. But we would we would not uh, do very much. We call them rifle shots, where we would go hard on a play, box out, rebound, not go to the other end. Then we go. We talk about the next play. Go hard on. I always we always went pretty hard the day before a game, but it wouldn't be like up and down and up and down. But we relied a lot on video. Um, it depends on the time of the game. If we played in the afternoon, we'd be watching video with the team that night. You're allowed to do that in tournaments. And then the next day, uh, there'd be two more videos. We watched, we watched a lot of video. Um, a a follow-up on that from, from me is, how do you expect that that's going to feel, or, or just the tournament this year being all in Indiana, COVID protocols, um, yeah. fans, but, but capped at 25%. Like, how do you envision, though, that – NCAA tournament setting playing out or, or unique challenges that might be worth, you know, kind of paying attention to. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I, I don't know. Cause I haven't coached in it all right now. It's going to be, it have to be really hard. I was watching that game yesterday and, and, you know, we had some, we had some great games at Ohio state and, and watching the Ohio state game that, uh, that somebody had me watching the Ohio state game when, when uh, we beat them on a, uh, on Tim Hardaway uh, had made some big threes and Aaron Kraft, you know, uh, they missed a shot at the end. And I looked at that crowd. It was electric. And I just, so I just thought about yesterday's game. What a great road win that would have been with even in front of the Ohio state fans, how nice that would have been. So I, I, I don't know how it's going to be. I, I got to think it's still going to be exciting for the players to, to win it all. But nothing can replace – I mean, college basketball is, is really hard to match it when we don't have the great fans that we have all over the country, you know, tuning into this, especially in March. Uh, and we got – our last video question is from Madonna in Illinois. What's the best advice you've given Coach Howard, and did it have anything to do with super soakers and – when to attack the team with water. <laughs> no, we, uh, we haven't talked at all about super soakers, but you know, he, when he got the job, uh, that was, uh, it was wonderful because he had been, he had been one of the guys that was coaching. That was a former player. There's many of them, but one of the guys that came back thirsty to coach, not just a different, 
just a different mindset, wanted to really, uh, you know, talk with me and talk with our staff. And, and he shared things from the NBA with, with Miami with us too, just exchange ideas. So that's really good that, that he was so thirsty and hungry. So he didn't need a whole lot. He's had some really good coaches, but he did come. He drove to Cle- or he, he came to Cleveland and met with me one time, and we just talked about the team and the Big Ten and things like that. And then he spoke at my class this year. And his, his thing is, you know, he's really – he knew things weren't broken, so he was – he was going to keep a lot, but he wanted to put his own stamp on it, which is obviously he has to do, and he's done that beautifully. Uh, having you know, so much, some of the staff is there. Um, the uh, he, he's really done a great, just a great job of you know embracing the culture that was working, but also he's doing some magnificent stuff that is really uh, it, it, that that he brought in that has really helped this team as well. Awesome. Well, coach, thank you so much for taking some time and and answering some questions. I know our alumni really appreciate it and are glad to hear, you know, that you're, you know, again, still, you've got this super soaker stash and that you're going to have a war at some point with the grandkids. It's very (laughs) important to a lot of people. Um, But we really appreciate your perspective on this year's team and and your career and and everything. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Nicole. You know, that we, uh, there, there's nothing better than than our alums and, and how they have treated our basketball program, my family, everybody over those great 12 years at, at Michigan. So I've, made a, I've forced them to make some good decisions in my life. Coming to Michigan was tremendous. It has a lot to do with the support we have from so many in our alumni association. So thanks for uh, having me uh, do this, and I hope it was helpful and entertaining. And let's hope we're not doing Zooms for the rest of our life, that we can see each other in person very soon. That would be great. We'll uh, hopefully get to do that soon. Go blue. All right. Go blue.